Hello, everyone. Uh, I'd say let's uh, let's get started. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Steve Masidi. I'm the director of machines for microfluidics. Uh, I've been traveling to India for the past five years, um, delivering these types of presentations, talking about our technology and mostly about how to solve these application challenges. Um, this year, um, the the trip got canceled and um, we have uh, uh, Dr. Young Su, who is um, the, the manager of uh, technology and applications, and he's going to be presenting a really great presentation, um, talking about our technology and some, some new, some of the latest application examples that we have. Um, so <clears throat> um, just a couple of rules. Um, we are recording the meeting, so um, please take note of that. And also, um, we're going to keep everybody on mute just to um, minimize background noise. If you have any questions, though, please don't hesitate to take yourself off mute and ask. If, um, if you want uh, to get our attention, there's a raise hand button. And also, um, we will be answering questions in the chat window. So um, Young will be presenting, and I will have the chat window open. And myself and some other members of the microfluidics team are here to to chat as well. So please, um, please feel free to interact with us as much as possible. And we really hope to have enough time for a question and answer session at the end of the meeting as well. So you can feel be um, you can feel free to hold your questions until then as well. All right, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Young. Thanks, Steve. Can everyone hear me OK? All right. Sounds good. Great. OK. Uh, yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, it's un unfortunately, we can't uh, really travel uh, to meet you in person, so it's really nice to meet all of you virtually. Um, I'm Yang Su from Microfix, and uh, I want to thank you again for attending today's lab webinar. Here's the agenda for my today's presentation. Uh, I'd like to start with a quick introduction to tell you a little bit more about microfluidics. Um, although as you will see in a couple of slides that we do serve a variety of different industry, uh, my focus today will be on the applications for biopharma industry. Um, I'll talk about some common challenges uh, or requirements uh, during the development and production of biopharma nanotechnology applications, and then talk about why our microfluidizer technology is a unique technology and the ideal solution to address um, those challenges and requirements uh, with a case study from these four applications, biopharma nanomotions, liposomes, polysaccharides, and cell disruptions. I will end my presentation by showing you our diverse product portfolio and then be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Microfix is under our parent company, IDEX. We are part of the Material Processing Technologies, or MPT, platform, and their IDEX health and science technologies segments. Some of you may have already uh, know or are familiar with our uh, other brands and their MPT, but recently uh, we just welcomed our fifth brand, Cerados, to join our platform. Microfluidics itself was founded about 40 years ago, and we specialize in design and producing high, pressure, high shear fluid processors using our unique interaction chamber technology. We're located in Massachusetts, just outside of Boston, uh, but we do have a global presence uh, with thousands of processors sold to customers all around the world. As I mentioned already, we're part of the IDEX MPT platform, our technology is used to help many industries, including the pharmaceutical and biotech industry, chemical industry, food and nutraceutical industry, as well as cosmetic industry in both development stages and product manufacturing. We believe our customer success is our success, and we do our best to serve our customers with our extensive experience in applications, as well as machine designs, so we can provide tailored solution to our customers and enable them to achieve each of their specific processing goals. Now, nanoparticles and nanotechnologies are widely used in the biopharma industry. 
When talking about developing biopharma nanotechnology applications, especially drug products, uh, there are many factors needs to be considered. A few common challenges and requirements related to process development and manufacturing are given here. First and foremost are the physical chemical properties. Among so many important properties, uh, particle size characterization is one of them, and it is arguably the most important one. To be able to control the particle size and distribution of nanoparticles is critical since they control and affect other correlated properties, uh, such as solubility, stability, product performance, such as ability to reach target sites, improve viability or efficacy, and et cetera. Particle size and distribution are also very important for generic drug development. Many of you may have heard and or are familiar with the uh, Q123 approaches. To demonstrate the equivalency of the test product to the reference listed drug or RLD. So here, um, let me just briefly uh, explain that. Q1 refers to qualitative sameness, which requires the same active and inactive ingredients as the RLD. And Q2 refers to quantitative sameness, which requires the same amount or concentrations as the RLD. For some complex generic products, a third requirement, Q3, which means physical chemical similarity, sometime may also be necessary. So according to FDA's product specific guidance for generic drug development, many drug products, including some of damaged drugs, can use the much easier in vitro study option instead of going the full in vivo way to demonstrate the bioequivalence. So as part of the Q3 in vivo physical chemical test, population bioequivalence or PBE based on the particle size and distribution within certain confidence interval is a key criterion needs to be met. So for example, um, if you want to achieve matching PBE, um, you can either uh, match the uh, D50 particle size and span or the Z average particle size and polydispersity index or PDI. Uh, depends on uh, which particle size um, analyzing techniques uh, you used. So even though uh, for some generic development, even though uh, in vivo test it's still required, um, it is likely that you still need to do the in vitro study, um, which means you still need to match the particle size and distribution. Um, so you can see here that matching particle size and distribution is very important for certain generic drug formulations. Um, this clearly ex explains why the ability to choose it, uh, to achieve a desired particle size and, and distribution is crucial when uh, considering the right manufacturing technology. So the next requirement is that the selected technology should be robust enough and be able to produce repeatable results to ensure batch to batch consistency. The choice should also be future proof in terms of scalability, which means uh, can be easily scaled up for manufacturing with guaranteed scale up results. Another result, uh, another benefit, uh, requirement or rather benefit is the process uh, should also uh, be able to improve or lead to either downstream or adjacent processes. For example, uh, injectables and ophthalmic drugs require sterilization to remove bacteria. Uh, usually autoclave is a, white, uh, it's a, uh, a commonly used sterilization process. Uh, however, many active ingredients are heat Labile, uh, which means um, you can't really use uh, high temperature um, to do the sterilization, so which means autoclave is not feasible uh, in that case. So a simple and economic alternative way to do this uh, is by passing the product through sterile filters. Those filters are made of membranes, have rated pore size of about 0.22 microns or 220 nanometers which means the majority of the particles in the product should be smaller than that size to ensure an efficient filtration process. So this again tied back to the requirements that you need to achieve um, a good particle size and size distribution, which means generating uh, size controllable nanoparticles is, uh, is, is very important. And last but not least, the manufacturing equipment needs to allow the entire manufacturing process to comply with the regulatory requirements 
such as the CGMP requirements. Uh, many processes, especially pharmaceutical manufacturing processes, also require that equipment is capable of running uh, CIP, which is clean in place, or and SIP, uh, which is sterilization in place processes. So microfluidics technology can actually address all these challenges and requirements from development to production with its unique advantages in achieving target processing results and guaranteed scalability. The uniqueness of the microfluidizer technology is that the microfluidizer processor ensures that every milliliter of material gets the same high shear treatment, regardless if you are processing a batch of a few milliliters or at thousands of liters per hour. The principle of the microfluidizer technology and how the system works uh, explained in this diagram here. Product enters the system via the inlet reservoir and is pulled into a constant pressure pumping system, which pushes the material through a fixed geometry interaction chamber at pressures up to 30,000 PSI, where the material experiences constant high shear rate and impact forces. So all materials inside the chamber receive the same treatment to achieve constant, consistent and reliable results. Uh, after passing through the interaction chamber, the product is effectively temperature controlled and collected. We offer two different interaction chamber designs. As you can see here, showing in the top graph, this is the white type chamber. The white chamber has two micro channels and the sample impinges on each other after passing through the micro channels. The impingement lead to intensive micro mixing and so are ideal for liquid liquid dispersing. Uh, therefore, the white type chamber is ideal for preparing nanomotions, liposomes, polymer nanoparticles, and etc. The interaction chamber showed in the bottom graph here uh, is the Z type chamber design. The Z chamber only has one micro channel and the material impacts with a solid wall after exiting the channel. The Z-chamber is ideal for processing samples contain solids in the case of uh, various solid suspensions and dispersions, also include cell disruptions. As I mentioned already, that a unique advantage of the microfluidizer technology is if its efficiency and uniform processing. Uh, this is the result of constant processing pressure achieved by the combination of intensifier pump and fixed geometry interaction chamber, as shown here. In this graph, you can see the actual pr pressure profile uh, measured for the microfluidizer processor uh, as shown as the green curve. So you can see as the plunger inside the intensifier pumps moves forward to pressurize the sample, the process pressure quickly reaches to the target pressure or the set pressure, uh, which in this case is 30,000 PSI and stays there for the majority of the cycle. The zero pressure period occurs when the plunger retracts and no sample is moved and processed during this, during this time. So uh, this period won't affect or lead to any interference with the processed material or results. Whereas in the case of conventional high pressure homogenizer with valves, the gap between the valve and the valve seat uh, vibrates when the piston is constantly pumping the materials through. Although the tiny vibration is exaggerated in this animation here, uh, it can actually cause great variations uh, in process pressure as shown, also showing this graph here uh, as represented by the red curve. So you can see here in this particular case, the process pressure can drop as much as 50% and only stays at the target pressure for a fraction of the uh, entire process cycle. That means the sample was processed under many different pressures or shear rates, and you can tell the process is nowhere near uniform processing. The resulting particles usually show slower size reduction speed and with very broad distributions as compared to the much faster size reduction and tighter distribution achieved by the microfluidizer processor, um, as you can see from uh, the graph shown here. So the sample process through through microfluidizer processor, which are the three green curves here, uh, all showed small particle size with very good distribution, even after just one path. 
whereas the sample processed through a uh, high pressure uh, homogenizer and their identical condition, which means in this case, the exact same uh, process pressure, temperature, and for the same number of passes, showed as all these uh, red curves here, all have large particle size and wide distribution, uh, as indicated by the either the bimodal or multimodal distributions. So even uh, after five passes, the distribution was still bimodal, and the particle size was much uh, worse than just one pass after the microfertilizer processor. This leads to my first application, pharmaceutical nanomotions, and I will use a few examples to demonstrate the use of our technology in this application. Uh, my first example is producing ophthalmic uh, emulsion, and specifically in this case uh, with diflupretinate as the active ingredient. Diflupretinate is a steroid, and uh, it's used to treat eye swelling and pain after eye surgery. The emulsion is actually formulated with castor oil as the carrier oil. It is currently available on the market at Durazo as a brand name and is marketed by Alcom. So the goal in this study is to develop a process to replicate particle size and distribution of the RLD as shown in this both this graph and the table here. Uh, I want to point out, so you can see from the table, uh, this particular motion is not, uh, does not only have small particle size, but also have very tight distributions as indicated by the PDI, or generally below 0.1, uh, which obviously would require a very robust method for processing this motion. To optimize the process, we tested several different process parameters as well as concentrations within the formulation. So I will walk you through uh, the effects of changing individual parameters quickly, just to give you an idea on how to use the rules results during your process development and to, re to help you uh, reach the target particle size and distribution. Uh, I want to point out since the sample uh, process through the uh, uh, microfertilizer processor for multiple passes is, is very easy uh, and uh, was essentially done for all tests. So therefore, uh, the effect of pass, uh, number of passes were included when uh, evaluating all other parameters. So the first factor we're looking at is the selection of inaction chamber. Uh, since we do have multiple options for both chamber types and size of the microchannels, as I mentioned before already, the white type chamber is ideal for emulsions. Uh, so we look at two uh, effects from two different white type chambers. Uh, the difference between the two chambers that they have uh, different size of the microchannels, which means they generate different shear rates um, at different pressures. Uh, so you can see from the uh, processing results shown in this graph here. Uh, let me just uh, explain the, uh, uh, the graph real quick here. Uh, so the particle size is plotted against uh, the left y axis here, uh, represented by the blue color. Uh, the distribution or the PDI um, is plotted against the uh, the secondary y-axis on the right-hand side here uh, and are represented by the green color. The two bars here represents the target particle size and the target PDI ranges. So from the results, you can see that the two Y-type chamber tested yielded similar particle size, uh, but Y-chamber 2 represented by this dashed line here was able to achieve smaller overall PDI which, as I mentioned before, that um, this may be a very important uh, uh, factor to consider uh, because in this case, the motion does require a very tight uh, distribution. Uh, so we selected Y chamber two uh, for further testing. So the effect of number of passes uh, was as expected. As you can see that in general, both uh, particle size and distribution decreases with increasing the number of passes. We then look at the effect of varying process pressure with other parameters fixed. The effects are plotted here again uh, in this graph. You can see that the pressure affected the particle size more than distribution, as the PDS were all similar, but particle size were more separated from each other. So what's interesting in this, in this case, as you can tell from the graph, is uh, this particular formulation did not respond very well to high pressure. And 
And actually, the particle size uh, was inverse proportional to pressure. Uh, so higher pressure resulted larger particle size. So this may also because that emulsion was overprocessed at higher pressure. Overprocessing sometimes can happen if you put too much energy uh, into the system during the process, uh, which uh, can lead to reagglomeration or recoil license of the droplets. Uh, so therefore, the results here suggested that this emulsion uh, may need to be processed at medium or lower pressure. Temperature was the next parameter studied. Uh, this graph shows the effect of temperature, and you can see another interesting finding uh, from the results shown here. Uh, so the formulation is indeed very sensitive to temperature. So however, temperature seems to have uh, nonlinear effects on particle size and PDI. Uh, as increasing temperature, uh, that's re represented by the three curves here, initially decreased both particle size and PDI. However, at higher temperature, the results showed opposite effect. Uh, low PDIs within the target range was, was, was achieved, uh, which is good in this case, but particle size went back up and was above the target range. So given that achieving smaller PDI may be more critical and difficult in, for this emulsion, process at higher temperature may be necessary. So finally, we look at the effect of varying concentrations without changing the compositions. So using a relative concentrated formulation is often possible especially for uh, emulsions, since you can always dilute the sample or the product to reach the final desired concentration afterwards. Obviously, you need to check to make sure that the particle size and distribution do not change after dilution. And in this case, uh, we tested and confirmed that the nano emulsion was um, stable enough for dilution. Um, so again, here, concentration affected the particle size more than PDI. And the effect was more complicated uh, also. As you can see, when the uh, concentration passed a certain limit, uh, both particle size and PDI will start to uh, uh, change in the opposite direction. So I've showed a lot of uh, uh, results uh, for each individual effect. So after considering the results from all the factors, um, uh, actually, uh, eventually we were able to come up with two different formulations and process conditions that can match the RLD particle size and distribution very well. This example definitely showed the capability of the microfilter technology in achieving a challenging goal for a very challenging uh, formulation. Uh, the results also tells us that there may be multiple ways to get you to the target. And this gives you actually gives you options and flexibility to uh, be able to select a path or a process that meets your specific process requirement and capabilities. Before my, I move on to my next example, I'd just like to uh, quickly point out here that uh, during this study, uh, we didn't really do like a, a formal design of experiments, uh, rather just to, you know, use the effects to guide us to, uh, uh, to the final process. Uh, but you can certainly do this in a more formal way by conducting a DOE and use uh, statistical tools such as the uh, response surface methodology to better drive your process optimization. The second hey Young, real quick, real quick. Yep. Um, we just got a, a good question um, in the chat window. <clears throat> How does initial particle size of the emulsion, so the before processing material, impact the number of passes and the processing pressure? Uh, that's actually a good question. Uh, so in general, our system, um, so for, first, um, uh, the first thing uh, requirement for initial particle size is uh, it should be in a good range that emulsion is stable or the pre-emulsion, the coarse emulsion is stable. Um, we don't want to see phase separation before passing through our system. So that's the first requir requirement. Uh, so after that, actually our system uh, is actually robust um, enough. So usually we see the system can actually accept a, a very good range of uh, pre-emulsion ranging from uh, several uh, microns uh, to several tens of microns. So that's usually uh, yielded uh, very similar results. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Vivek Viswanathan, um, you have your hand up still. Uh, would you like to take yourself off mute and um, respond? I don't know if, you, if that answered your question or if you have a follow-up question. Yeah, hi. Uh, that that answered my question. I was just inquisitive about the range, which uh, he rightly pointed out. 
Thank you. Thank you. No problem. All right, so if there's no other questions. Let me continue to my uh, second uh, case study. Uh, in this case is an example of anesthetic emulsion uh, that encapsulates and delivers propofol. The propofol is used to induce and maintain station. Uh, the propofol demand actually has been increased recently during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic due to increased requirements as the stative for ventilated patients. Uh, propofol emulsion is formulated with soybean oil as the carrier oil and is currently available on the market as the Preven, which is the name brand uh, marketed by Fresenius Cabi. And there are also uh, several generic versions available as well. So let me show you quickly the processing results of propofol emulsion uh, by the microfluidizer processor. Um, you can see from the results here, both uh, the microscope images and the table um, that the uh, uh, the microfluidizer processor can actually uh, efficiently reduce the particle size of this emulsion. Um, you can see from the image here, uh, after processing uh, three times through the system at 20,000 PSI, you can see the droplets become very small and, and uniform compared to the unprocessed emulsion, uh, which actually kind of give you, uh, tied back to the, uh, the previous question, kind of give you an idea about the size uh, at the beginning. So when you look at the uh, particle size uh, data here, shown in this table, um, you can see we quickly achieved the a D50 particle size um, around to around 180 nanometers. Uh, and please note, uh, so this measurement here are based on volume, so which means uh, in this case, the D50 particle size uh, represent that the motion, 50% um, of the droplets in terms of volume are smaller than this size. So although uh, in this case, propofol is actually a stable drug and uh, uh, it's very stable at high temperature, uh, which means the emulsion can actually be autoclaved for sterilization. Uh, but processing results shown here that the D90 particle size um, after three passes, again, remember this is a uh, this is a volume based uh, results. So which means 90% of the droplets are smaller uh, than this size, which is around 240 nanometers. Uh, this size is really close um, to the sterile filter um, average pore size, um, 220 nanometers. Um, so this uh, indicate that most droplets are small and maybe they are small enough to, uh, so the emulsion can actually be filter sterilized, which is usually an uh, easier and, uh, and more economic way to do the sterilization. Hey Young, we've got uh, another question. Okay. This is from, Anupam Chowdhury. Um, it's <clears throat> this is the question, and I don't really understand it, but I think it might have to do with bottom up versus top down. The question is: Does it help in top to bottom approach in synthesis of nanoparticles? For example, can a 500 nanometer particle be scaled down to 100 nanometer dimensions by controlling pressure and number of passes? Uh. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the question either. But I'll just I'll I'll, I'll try my best to answer it. Um, I I think uh, it, it it depends on the material and the formulation. So uh, I would say in general, it's very possible, uh, especially because our system does uh, put a lot of energy. Um, the if the particles are liquid, as I showed you at the droplets in the case of emulsions or even liposomes, um, this is a lot easier because the the droplets are softer and you can use the shear uh, to break them or use the energy dis dissipation uh, to help break them down. Uh, so that's this basically uh, everything I showed. Let me go back here uh, so that you can de decrease your particle size uh, with this technology. Uh, I don't really have the example shown here, but I can just uh, uh, make a quick comment here. Uh, if you're talking about solids, uh, that that varies a lot depending on the uh, the type of the material and the nature of, of the material. Um, Sometimes we uh, we are very efficient to uh, reduce a lot of the different materials, uh, especially down to like a micron range or sub micron range. Um, 
But sometimes uh, for uh, some challenging uh, formulations and materials, uh, get down to like 100, 200 nanometers, that will be uh, that will be difficult for for top down method. And uh, this is true actually for uh, I, I, I think this is true for all the top down method, um, not just for us. Great, thanks, Young. Um, yeah, so I hope that I hope that answers the question. May, maybe if um, you know, maybe after the call, we could get some more information about um, this specific apl application. Um, so, um, Anupam, we will uh, we will reach out to you after the call and and see if we can answer the question better for your specific application. Thank you. Thanks. Um, one more question. Um, it's uh, though it is recommended to use a Y chamber for nano emulsions. Um, can we use uh, Z chamber as well? So uh, I, th I think the quick answer is yes. There's nothing against you to use a Z type chamber. It's just from our experience, uh, Y type chamber uh, usually performs better than the Z type chamber for a lot of emulsion, especially the oil and water um, low concentration emulsions, uh, which I mean low concentration is the oil phase usually, um, I don't want to put a hard number, but usually around 20-30% uh, of your total formulation. We do have seen uh, in uh, several cases that uh, Z chamber may outperform the Y chamber. That's usually the uh, the other way around the water and oil emulsion um, or the very high con concentration, uh, like if you have more than 40-50% of oil. Um, in, in certain cases, we have seen the Z chamber performs better, but in general, we would recommend the Y type chamber. Thanks, Young. All right, let me move to my next, which is the third um, case study for nano motions. Uh, so this is actually a, a scaled up example. Um, which is the largest scale production of an adjuvant nanomotion. Uh, the study was done in collaboration with our longtime partner, the Infectious Disease Research Institute, or IDRI. Uh, and the data was actually just published uh, back in July this year in a special COVID-19 issue of pharmaceuticals. The formulation of interest here uh, in this study is IDRI's own squalene-based nanomotion developed as a vaccine adjuvant. Squalene-based emulsion have been uh, proved to be effective vaccine adjuvants and have been used in several approved vaccines, uh, such as the, uh, uh, the MF59 developed by Novartis, or is used in flu ad, which is the seasonal flu vaccine, and GSK's um, ASO3 adjuvant used in the pandemic uh, flu vaccines. The ASO3 vaccine uh, adjuvant is also used in several developmental uh, protein-based vaccines um, for COVID-19. I've just heard this uh, uh, last week that one of those candidates co-developed by GSK and Sanofi moved into human trials last week. And the two companies were launching a very large uh, phase one, two clinical trial. The objective of this study is to uh, scale up Idris current manufacturing process uh, in the case that they need to respond to a pandemic situation. And the requirement is they need to be able to supply 50 million total dosage of adjuvant within the time period of three months. So after uh, considering all the factors along with making a few assumptions, uh, Idris has come up with an uh, initial estimate that the production scale needs to be able to process 1 million dose daily in terms of uh, batch size in order to meet the requirement. Obviously, the scale up results needs to meet the criteria of matching particle size. In this case, the Z average particle size needs to be less than uh, 100 nanometers, along with several other physical chemical properties. Um, the last requirement is the production batch needs to be processed at Idris CGMP facility, which means the scale up solution or equipment needs to um, comply with the CGMP requirements. So when we start to talk to uh, Idri uh, about the scale up solution, uh, we actually found that there was still room to improve their process since it was not done at the optimum conditions. Uh, for example, the original formulation has relatively low oil concentration, which means you need to process a larger batch uh, to be able to produce enough adjuvant emulsion. 
And the process would also require more than 10 passes to reach target particle size. Uh, this also translates into a much larger throughput uh, requirement. So we help them to optimize the formulation and conditions before scaling up their process. Uh, I'm not going to talk um, all that details here. If you're interested, uh, please uh, read the published paper. Uh, or we also have an applications note uh, just published to uh, summarize the paper. Um, they have more details in there uh, about the process optimization. I'm just going to show you uh, the optimized uh, results here. Um, so the opt, uh, optimized lab scale results uh, was done on our small pilot machine, uh, the M110EH microfilter processor that can process about a third of a liter of sample uh, per minute. And you can see from the, uh, the results plotted here in this graph that process uh, after the process and, and the um, formulation optimization, uh, only either two or three passes is enough uh, to achieve uh, the emulsion with desired particle size and their distribution. Um, and this condition was selected for the scale up production runs. Before I uh, show you the uh, scale up results, let me quickly explain how do we scale up and guarantee the results. Uh, so when we scale up, we don't do the same thing as the, uh, you know, the valve homogenizers would do. Uh, they usually use a larger valve and increase the gap to get higher throughput. Uh, so we don't increase the size of the microchannel inside the interaction chamber uh, because doing that basically ruins all the parameters you develop on the lab scale. Instead, we use multiple parallel aligned identical channels. So as long as you keep the process pressure the same, the product will experience identical uniform shear and impact treatments inside each channel, and that's achieve a guaranteed linear scale up results. And let's look at the uh, scale up results here. Uh, so remember, this is the uh, results I showed you earlier from the uh, lab scale or the pilot scale. So when the same emulsion was processed on one of our production scale machines, in this case, the M7250, uh, machine which can uh, achieve about five liters per minute uh, as a flow rate at 30,000 psi. And you can see from the graph that the production machine achieved excellent results under the same processing condition. Uh, the, distri the distribution curves uh, were slightly better after the first pass, at, if you look at the two uh, blue curves. And after the second, uh, which we represented by the red curves and the third, which represented by the green curves, uh, the results were almost identical as the curves are overlapping on each other. So with this optimized formulation and process, uh, so remember uh, we cut down a lot on the number of passes and also increased the oil phase concentration, uh, plus a few other changes around the entire process identified and improved by Idri. Uh, Idri eventually came to this conclusion that the adjuvant production capacity can reach 5 million doses per day, which is five times of their original target. And what's better is that this 5 million dose production capacity can be done with just a single 200 liter batch. Um, and the entire process, including the pre-mixing step, processing through the microfilter, uh, large scale microfilter processor, and post-process sterile filtration can be completed in less than eight hours or within just a single shift. So this example concludes my uh, uh, case studies for nanomotions. And uh, let's move on to my next application, which is libosomes, if there's no further questions around this. All right. So libosomes are spherical lipid vesicles with a bilayered membrane structure. So they have been used as both drug delivery system and vaccine adjuvant in commercialized products. We have presented data for liposome vaccine adjuvants uh, in previous webinar. And uh, so my examples today are for uh, liposomes will be on the drug delivery side. So if you're interested in our uh, other webinars, please check it, check them out on, from our website or uh, reach out uh, uh, to us for more information. Uh, in general, when using microfilter technology to produce liposomes, uh, it is essentially a top-down process based on the film hydration method. Uh, so if you're not familiar, I'm, I'll just uh, in, uh, explain real quick here. Um, so in, in, the, in the film hydration process, uh, homogeneous lip, lipid mixture, including the uh, lipophilic actives, is formed first and then hydrated, usually in the buffer solution. 
so the microstructure processor is then used to if efficiently downsize the liposome vesicles to achieve desired size and laminarities. Uh, in the past few years, uh, we've been collaborating uh, with Professor Yvonne Perry and her group at the University of Strasbourg uh, for liposome formulations and process development with the microstructure technology. The first liposome formulation we looked is the liposomal amphotericin B formulation. So uh, liposomal amphotericin B is a well-known antifungal drug product. Uh, amphotericin B is hydrophobic, so uh, it is encapsulated inside the bilayer region. Liposomal amphotericin B is currently available on the market at Ambisome um, and marketed by Astella in the US. The objective of this study is to create a generic amphotericin B loaded liposome formulation and study the effect of process parameters uh, to be able to create amphotericin B uh, liposomes with properties similar to ambisome. Uh, so liposome, liposomal ambisome formulation uh, include high transition temperature lipids, uh, which means the preparation, including the hydration and the entire processing um, should be carried out at a temperature at least a few degrees higher than the highest phase transition temperature. Um, so this is important for uh, processing liposomes. Um, as I mentioned already, the process followed the traditional uh, lipid film hydration method, as illustrated in this uh, diagram here. Uh, as I mentioned already, uh, the first step is create a lipid mixture um, with the uh, uh, lipophilic actives, which in this case, the amphotericin B. And upon remove the, the solvent, you create a film and then rehydrate it in the buffer solution. And then uh, uh, the hydration caused the, uh, the lipid to self-assemble into uh, uh, multilaminar vesicles, uh, which is big and with um, many uh, uh, bilayers, um, so called MLVs. And then you use the, uh, uh, in this case, we use the M110P benchtop microfluidizer processor uh, to reduce the vesicle size and laminarity. We've uh, presented the results from this study uh, at last year's CRS, uh, which is the Controlled Release Society annual meeting. And um, I'm gonna, only going to show uh, some data here. Uh, so as you can see that when, pro when processed this formulation at 30,000 PSI, the particle size was reduced to slightly over just 100 nanometers after about five passes. Uh, both PDIs and Z potential reached a plateau after about three passes. Uh, as expected, increasing temperature did lead to some improvements to the particle size and distribution. As you can see, uh, the high temperature results are represented by the closed circle. So compared to the open circle, um, you can see the particle size was smaller with better uh, distribution. So looking at the encapsulation efficiency here, um, Good drug loading has been uh, achieved after just about three passes, uh, and the encapsulation rate uh, quickly reached uh, to about 100%. Uh, so this example demonstrates that the microfluidizer technology can not only maximize entrapment of lipophilic drug, but also reduce size, uh, produce well uh, size well-controlled liposome vesicles with homogeneous distribution. Then move on to see if we can reproduce another well-known liposome formulation um, that it used to encapsulate hydrophilic active, uh, which in this case is the liposomal doxorubicin formulation. Doxorubicin is an anti-cancer drug uh, and has been approved for treating uh, different, uh, several different kinds of cancers and tumors. Um, liposomal doxorubicin is formulated with pegylated lipids and was the first FDA approved the nano drug delivery system based on pegylated liposome technology. So pegylation uh, helps increase the, uh, the blood circulation time of the nanoparticles inside the body and potentially uh, achieve higher accumulation of those particles at the target site, for example, uh, at the tumors, um, and that leads to a better uh, efficacy. The brand name Doxo is currently marketed by Baxter in the US and there are uh, several uh, generic versions of uh, dox or doxorubicin liposomes are available, uh, both uh, supplied from uh, Sign Pharma and Dr. Redis. The objective of this study is to develop a generic version of doxorubicin liposome formulation uh, to achieve a target size between 80 to 120 nanometers 
uh, and high drug encapsulation rate, in this case, uh, more than 90%. As I mentioned already, the doxorubicin lipozone is formulated with pegylated lipid. In this case, the uh, DSPE PAC2000 with other lipids. Another uh, uh, unique feature about uh, this formulation is that doxorubicin is actually loaded after the em empty lipozone vesicles are created. The loading is usually done by creating a transmembrane pH or ionic gradients. Uh, the process is called active loading or remote loading and can actually achieve a, a very high encapsulation rate. So looking at the results shown here, uh, process the different pressures. So you can see uh, both of the actually uh, lower pressure at 15,000 PSI or at medium pressure, uh, 20,000 PSI yielded good results in terms of particle size, uh, distribution, as well as drug loading, uh, with the uh, results achieved at 20,000 PSI actually uh, more consistent uh, before and after the tangential flow filtration or the TFF step. Um, so the, T, uh, the results after TFF uh, are represented by the open circles here. Uh, so without are the closed circle in this case. So the TFF step is used for buffer exchange. Uh, remember, we need to create the transmembrane uh, gradients uh, before drug loading. Uh, and also the TFF uh, is used to remove the unencapsulated free drug after drug loading. So empty liposome particles uh, were able to reduce to below uh, 100 nanometers to around 80 to 90 nanometers, and the PDI was uh, below 0.2. Quantification of drug loading resulted in over 90% of encapsulation efficiency in all uh, tests. So although uh, the data is now shown here, uh, we have confirmed that after loading the doxorubicin into the liposomes, uh, that's uh, drug loading only slightly increased the particle size um, so essentially, our goal has been successfully achieved here uh, to achieve the target particles with good distribution with uh, high encapsulation rate. And additionally, uh, with the process involving the TFF step, there will be no further purification uh, step required for the manufacturing process. Hey, Young. Yep. Can we uh, pop in with a couple questions? Sure. OK, can you go to your last slide, please, real quick? This question is mostly about what's the average and what's PDI. Okay. Um, all right. Sorry about that. Um, so this is uh, um, this is a different technique. Uh, so the Z average represents uh, an average the particle size. Uh, PDI represents for polydispersity index, which usually uh, indicate the uh, the distribution. Um, so. These are uh, results from a, a different technique I showed you earlier, uh, which is showing you all the, if you remember, the uh, D1050, D90 particle size, which are based on uh, volume. Uh, these results are based on uh, intensity. So both techniques actually uh, use a laser-based measurement. Um, so this, this rely on the theory based on the dynamic uh, light scattering, uh, DLS. So the average size is somewhat uh, is a, is a mas mas mathematically averaged about particle size. Uh, so you can, in general, just look at that's close to uh, a somewhat of mean size. And PDI, as I mentioned, represents the uh, distribution. So if you have a, a single particle uh, size, you will end up with a zero PDI. So there's no variation. And if it's a true uh, heterogeneous distribution, the PDI will be equals to one. So PDI will be between zero and, and, and one. Usually uh, most people, uh, especially uh, for the pharmaceutical industry, uh, people would consider PDI below 0.2 means homogeneous particle size distribution. Awesome. Thanks, Young. I also see, uh, sorry, Chris Jackwin also responded in the chat window. So there's a, Thanks, Chris. another response there. Um, great. And then uh, one more question. Um, can this be used for techniques other than thin film hydration? So he, um, this person indicates an example of like when salts are used. So that's just kind of the, the remote loading versus the active loading maybe. Yeah, uh, so if that's the case, um, 
uh, the answer will be yes. So, um, so uh, like I mentioned, so our system essentially performs a, a, a downside step. Um, so it is used to reduce the, the liposome vesicle size. Um, so if you can use uh, remote loading or um, active loading, which which means you create an empty liposome first and load afterwards, um, that's usually achieve higher encapsulation rate. But you can actually um, run the process to achieve uh, what we call the passive loading. So which means you dissolve your actives in the aqueous phase. And as you perform the size reduction, you actually encapsulate that aqueous phase inside the uh, instead the liposome at the aqueous core uh, to achieve encapsulation. Uh, however, usually this will result in a lower encapsulation rate. Um, this is not because of the method of the uh, uh, preparation technique. Uh, if you use any other technique, you will achieve this uh, similar results. It, it's purely results from the physical limitation because as you start to reduce the liposome size, the volume encapsulated inside will also be reduced. And so that's basically depends on how much drug you can dissolve in your aqueous phase. I'm not sure if this answers the question. If, if not, maybe we can, uh, you know, uh, chat more or discuss more after uh, after the presentation. Yeah, I think this is, you know, this is a great question. And I think probably a lot of people who are working with liposomes are trying to eliminate this thin film hydration process because it's it's not great, right? Um, yeah. So uh, in that regard, uh, I want to add one just to wait for my next uh, case study. Uh, I'm going to oh. show you a, a different way. <laughs> Please proceed. OK. Uh, great. So uh, yeah, so my um, my next uh, case study actually, I, I think, partially answered that question. Um, um, it's not making the film or uh, it's not using the, the solvent, uh, which is an improved process uh, because with the uh, the success of the two uh, liposome formulation, um, so we continued our research to see if we can uh, solve a well-known and, uh, and also it's a very important issue across all liposome preparation techniques, uh, which, which is the use of organic solvents. Uh, because so far, solvent has to be used either sooner or later in the in the, in the process, regardless of which method you're using to create liposomes. For example, if you use the same field method, we have uh, discussed extensively. Uh, so you have to use the solvent to dissolve all the lipids to uh, uh, to form the film. Uh, even though the uh, the solvent will be removed before subsequent liposome preparation or downsizing, uh, it's still used there. Uh, uh, if you compare it to other methods like uh, the bottom-up method, such as the uh, the lab on the chip method or the solvent injection method, uh, they actually have to require the use of uh, a lipid solution uh, to be mixed with the aqueous phase um, during the liposome uh, formation step. So this means that the solvent actually presents in uh, in the uh, in the final product and needs to be removed from from the final product, which is usually a more difficult process. Uh, so that's a problem. So commonly used solvent uh, during the uh, preparation uh, step include chloroform, ethanol, methanol, and uh, uh, diethyl ether. So regardless of the method of selection, uh, the use of solvent is not preferred due to their potential safety and health concerns. So we started to uh, think about and and uh, and work on. Uh, to see if we can develop a newer pro a new process to create liposomes without using any solvent. And actually, I'm very happy to uh, report here that we actually uh, achieved that. We, uh, we've successfully developed a new solvent-free process to produce liposomes uh, with the team at the University of Strasbourg. And our work has actually just got published a couple months ago. Um, we also presented the data uh, already during this year's CRS virtual meeting. So with the new, uh, let me jump to the, uh, the, new, uh, the new process. So with the new, solvent-free process, we tested both previously presented liposome formulations again. Uh, and with this target uh, in terms of particle size, PDI, and drug loading. Uh, so the new process is illustrated here uh, in this diagram for making doxorubicin liposomes. As you can see here, uh, instead of uh, making the uh, uh, lipid film, we just uh, hydrated all lipid ingredients directly in the aqueous buffer. 
and then use a magnetizer processor to reduce the vesicle size. Um, so same as before, uh, we need to use a, a buffer exchange step um, to uh, to introduce the uh, the transmembrane gradients uh, for drug loading and remove the free drug after loading. Uh, so finally, the liposome solution will pass through sterile filters for sterilization. So the process for lipophilic active encapsulated liposomes uh, for uh, using this process uh, will be very, very similar. Um, for example, if you would create the amphotericin B liposomes, uh, all you need to do is just uh, to also add the, uh, the lipophilic, uh, lipophilic actives uh, in this step here, uh, mixed with the buffer directly. Um, and obviously, you don't need to use the uh, buffer exchange step, but you still have to perform the purification. So the results are showing uh, in this slide here. I apologize for a busy slide, uh, but you can see uh, this slide shows you uh, uh, several different charts uh, lined uh, for particle size and distribution, as well as surface charge and drug loading uh, throughout the entire uh, processing uh, steps. Um, uh, the first step is the production, which is the uh, uh, the microdesert processing step uh, to reduce the liposome particle size, and then the purification step, which uh, is the buffer exchange and, uh, uh, and drug loading step, and after drug loading and after uh, sterilization step. So as, as you can see from the uh, the, uh, the different bars and, and dots here, uh, the desired particle properties in, in terms of the particle size or PDI, and also surface charge, which represented as the zeta potential, as well as drug loading um, can be achieved either by processing at 18,000 PSI or 20,000 PSI for either two or three passes. With the, uh, with the higher pressure or um, more number of passes slightly uh, resulting uh, smaller particle size and smaller PDIs. Uh, but in all this condition, you can achieve um, uh, desired size, and also you can see uh, the particles are very stable throughout the process. Uh, the size and peak distribution, even the surface charge and drug loading are all uh, stays fairly constant. And you may also notice that the, the changes in the, uh, the surface charge here uh, before and after a buffer exchange and drug loading. So the reason was uh, at this stage, uh, of the production. The formulation was still in, um, in this case, in, uh, uh, in an uh, ammonium sulfate buffer, uh, which has a low pH. So after loading, or uh, which is done by subjecting to buffer exchange to set up the pH gradient, uh, the pH outside the liposomes become higher. Um, so that changes lead to the, uh, the decrease uh, in the surface charge, but you can see the surface charge uh, stays fairly constant afterwards. We, uh, we then compared the liposome created by the solvent-free method to the conventional method, which is the fume hydration method. Uh, so note here, uh, even though uh, the microfetizer processor is definitely capable of making liposomes via the traditional way, as I already showed you uh, uh, previously uh, with the two case study, uh, but for comparison purpose here, uh, we use the a sonication method to create um, a small batch uh, by the traditional way. Uh, so shown here are the, uh, the results of drug loading efficiency as well as uh, morphology of the liposomes um, created by uh, both methods. And you can see the solvent-free method not only provide uh, proved uh, its capability, but also uh, demonstrate it can result better um, outcomes. As you can see, that encapsulation efficiency was higher than that achieved by the traditional method. Uh, I think part of this uh, part of this reason was also because the, uh, the the selection or choice of the preparation method, um, the sonication method used um, did not generate a good uh, liposome particles, as you can see from this cryo TM image here. Um, so that's a solvent based and processed by sonication. You can see the uh, the particle size are not homogeneous. You can see some big particles and some small ones. Uh, whereas if you compare to um, the liposome vesicles achieved by the microfetizer processor uh, showed in this images here. 
So you can see the uh, very uh, uniform particle size uh, are achieved um, after pressing through the microfluidizer uh, processor. And you can also see that uh, in, in both, actually in both images, uh, you can also see that the, uh, the classic rectangular shaped um, um, <clears throat> doxorubicin crystals uh, inside the liposomes. Uh, so this is due to the recrystallization of the drug uh, after loading. Um, and this actually confirms that um, the drug was successfully loaded. Um, so this case study uh, confirms that the microfluidizer technology is not only capable to produce uh, excellent liposomes, um, but also superior uh, than other competitive technologies. In this case, the, uh, the sonication method. So we also got good results uh, with the uh, amphotericin B liposomes prepared by, by the solvent-free method as shown here. Uh, you can see after just one pass um, at 25,000 PSI, um, the vesicles were quickly reduced in both size and, and distribution. Uh, after two or three passes, the liposome vesicle reached target particle size, uh, PDI, as well as uh, Z potential and drug loading. In this experiment, drug loading uh, in particular actually was not affected by uh, the process at all. Um, the liposome can, liposomes can also be easily uh, sterilized using the sterile filters. And you can see uh, their characterizations uh, showing this table here. Um, the particle size, PDI, surface charge, and drug loading um, was not affected uh, after filtration. And also the morphology of the liposome can be seen from this cryo TM images, uh, and it confirms the particle size characterization. So uh, in summary, example of this two uh, classic liposome, liposomal formulation proved that the microfluidizer technology is very well capable of producing a variety of uh, liposome formulations with well-controlled particle size, as well as drug uh, encapsulations. Uh, the feasibility of using the solvent-free liposome preparation with microfluidizer processor added another uh, important benefit to our already efficient and scalable solution. I'm ready to uh, move on to my next application. Um, yeah, let's any, uh, uh, take a quick, a quick question. Um, there are a couple, there are a few questions that we'll get to, but I think um, I'd, I'd rather save them to the end. But this, this, um, there's one more question from uh, from Vivek Biswanathan about um, liposomes. So let's try and talk about that now, real quick, if that's all right. Sure. Um, how for for this uh, solvent-free process? How do you perform mixing in the initial phase? How do you ensure thorough interaction of lipids? with a hydrophobic and poorly wettable API? That's a quick question. Um, you can, uh, me, let me go back to here. Um, so you can actually uh, read more details uh, from the paper. But I think the, the, the step we took to uh, ensure the thorough mixing of all the lipid or hydrophobic ingredients is um, we need to perform at a, a good temperature, and you can see in this case, we uh, actually did it at a 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, so that's uh, above the phase transition temperature of the highest um, uh, transition temperature of all the lipid uh, ingredients. And we need to ensure we hydrate them long enough. Uh, we did a, an hour mixing here. Um, you can probably do uh, a little bit longer, depends on the formulation. Um, and, and we use a uh, uh, a high shear mixer also to help uh, um, hydrate the lipids. Um, and also, the, uh, it, it, it is discussed in the paper, and I wasn't showing the results here. Um, there's a, a, depending on your formulation, there there is a limitation on how much lipid uh, or the lipid concentration uh, you can put in there. Uh, we tested with different formulations, and we found there, there, there were li different limits. Uh, but we, in general, we can go uh, uh, very high. Uh, some formulation we, we achieved as high as uh, 80 or uh, maybe 100, if I remember that correctly, uh, milligrams per mil uh, at the lipid concentration, uh, which is usually uh, which is usually pretty high for the uh, liposome formulations. Great. Thank you. Um, all right, there's a couple more questions, but I think um, we have about 25 minutes left before the end of the session. So I, I think let's, uh, you have one more case study, right? 
I have two more actually. So two more. But, okay, let's uh, okay. let's go through yeah. those and then go through them. Uh, great, thank you. Great, thanks. Okay, my uh, my next application, I think it's a it's an interesting application. Um, uh, it's a it's kind of like a unique way to use our uh, technology. Um, this is uh, processing polysaccharides to reduce their molecular weights. Um, so polysaccharides are one of the uh, most abundant materials that you can find. And, and technically, starch, cellulose, and many other long-chain uh, polymer carbon hydrates all belong to polysaccharides. But uh, um, I'll talk about a different type of polysaccharides here today, uh, which is the bacterial capsular polysaccharide. Um, a lot of pathogenic bacteria commonly have a polysaccharide layer, uh, also called the capsule, outside the cell wall. Uh, so this sugar coat usually contains uh, antigenic proteins that can be used to make vaccines against the rose bacteria. Polysaccharide vaccines are a unique type, type of uh, inactivated uh, subunit vaccine. Pure polysaccharide vaccines are available for uh, diseases such as uh, pneumococcal disease, meningococcal disease, and uh, typhoid fever. Uh, so, however, pure polysaccharides do not uh, are not highly uh, uh, antigenic, so they're often conjugated with other proteins um, to form conjugate vaccines to improve their uh, immune response. One issue with uh, capsular polysaccharide is that there are high and non-uniform molecular weights. Uh, this usually leads to a more viscous solution and makes the downstream filtration and isolation process more difficult. Uh, to solve this issue, uh, molecular weight uh, of polysaccharides needs to be reduced to below uh, certain levels, so the polysaccharide solutions are more uh, manageable. Although there are many uh, uh, molecular weight reduction methods exist, both uh, mechanical method uh, or the chemical method, um, the mechanical treatment is usually preferred when comparing to the chemical process because uh, the mechanical process does not alter the structure of the polysaccharides, so their uh, immune response can be maintained. Microfidential technology actually works very well for this application, as you can see from this case study here. Uh, so the goal of this study was to reduce molecular weight of nine different serotypes of pneumococcal capsule polysaccharides to below uh, the molecular weight of 250 kilodaltons. Here are the results after processing those different polysaccharide samples through the microfertilizer processor. Um, you, can, you can see with this uh, yellow line here represents the target molecular weight. And you can see that the microfertilizer technology was able to successfully achieve the target molecular weight for eight out of the nine samples um, we processed. And most of the serotypes only uh, require a, a few passes, uh, for example, five or less, uh, to reach the desired molecular weight. Many of them even just require one pass. Uh, and the molecular weight uh, were already below the target. Um, so this example certainly this is a quick example, uh, but it certainly demonstrates the capability of our technology in this application. So if you're working in the field of polysaccharide vaccines, uh, the fast and, and uniform molecular weight reduction uh, achieved by our technology can certainly benefit you, uh, your research and your production. And then move on to my, uh, my next uh, and, and also the last application uh, in this presentation, uh, which is the cell disruption. Cell disruption or cell lysis is the process of breaking cell wall mem uh, or membrane to release intracellular fluids in order to obtain uh, molecules or, or particles of interest. It's an essential step during uh, the manufacturing of many biologic, uh, biological products. Uh, Microfilizer technology um, is a proven technology in cell disruption. Um, we works very well with many different uh, type of cells, ranging from mammalian cells, bacterial cells, uh, to algae and, and yeast cells. Um, but um, there have a lot of uh, you know uh, publications and and we have many customers using our technology uh, in this application. But I'd like to share a couple of interesting uh, applications with you uh, today. Uh, the first uh, uh, example is related to uh, molecular diagnostics. And now you may be already thinking that what does the microfidagic processor have to do with uh, diagnostics? Uh, so let me explain and show you how cell disruption by uh, microfidagic technology can be used in this field. The field of molecular diagnostic is definitely uh, expanding and evolving rapidly in response to the need of a rapid large-scale testing for uh, COVID-19. 
uh, because traditionally, if you use the uh, the whole viral culture, uh, it is not feasible um, because it usually takes days, a few days for the virus to cause obvious thetopathic changes in in vitro. Uh, plus, virus isolation requires biosafety level three facilities, which has very limited availability in many medical centers. So, therefore, currently nucleic acid based testing um, is the ideal and and the best solution. So uh, to perform those tests, uh, they both basically involve some basic uh, steps. After obtaining samples from the patient, the genetic material, uh, either the DNA or the RNA specific to the pathogen needs to be extracted first. And then the extracted gene needs to be amplified, uh, which means uh, making millions or, or billions of copies of that DNA uh, or genetic material. Uh, so the quantity is high enough for subsequent detection. Uh, the most fundamental and widely used amplification technique uh, is the polymerase chain reaction method or the PCR method. Uh, Sometimes uh, the reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction, uh, RT-PCR, is also used. Um, and actually, this is the case with the COVID virus. Um, since the viral genome is made of RNA, not DNA, so an extra step is needed to translate RNA into more stable uh, DNA before performing the PCR process. And the, the transcription is done by using uh, an enzyme, uh, which is the uh, reverse transcriptase. The PCR basically uses a rapid thermal cycling combined with enzyme to mimic and accelerate the natural DNA replication process in order to be able to create uh, many uh, new copies of the target DNA in a short period of time. There are many suitable polymerase. Uh, one of the most widely used uh, uh, enzyme is this uh, TAC polymerase. Uh, it is a thermal stable enzyme, so it's suitable for the thermal cycling uh, used in the PCR process. There's also another process that uses a different enzyme, uh, the helicase. Helicases can impact gene, uh, which means you don't need to uh, increase temperature to open up the DNA. So the combination of helicase and the polymerase allows the amplification to take place at, at the thermal condition. Uh, so all the enzymes I mentioned here, uh, including the, the uh, transcription um, enzyme, they, can, they all can be grown and harvested from the bacterial cell, such as E. coli. And um, as I mentioned already, the microfilter technology is a proven method that works very well in rupturing this type of cell. Uh, to demonstrate this, I'll use this example. So even though this specific example did not produce uh, the exact enzymes I mentioned uh, in my previous slide, um, but rather this enzyme showed here named organophosphate hydrolase, um, this is still a relevant case uh, because this enzyme was also expressed in E. coli and the results can certainly give you an idea on how well our technology works with bacterial cell uh, or E. coli cell. Uh, because we're usually very efficient and can achieve over 90% cell rupture rate after just one pass. Uh, as you can see from uh, the microscope images here, uh, the cells are completely ruptured after processing. Uh, and also, if you look at the uh, the product recovery um, uh, for, for the enzyme here, um, one or two passes at medium pressure, uh, which is 20,000 PSI in this case, give the highest enzyme recovery, uh, with two passes achieve the best overall results. And increasing process pressure starts to decrease the yield, which means you uh, may start to degrade the proteins at this point. So uh, the optimum pressure to rupture uh, E. coli uh, for this particular uh, product is about 20,000 PSI. Uh, I want to make a comment here that lower processing pressure uh, sometimes also add a benefit uh, when you scale up your process uh, because our production machine would be able to pro provide higher throughput at lower pressure. Obviously, uh, the best condition for your uh, specific cells and uh, products uh, of interest may uh, uh, may vary. Uh, you need to uh, perform um, uh, a little bit uh, optimization test to, to determine your own best conditions. Now, I'll move to uh, my final example, uh, which is harvesting uh, viral vectors for uh, delivering 
therapeutic genes and next generation vaccines uh, or nucleic acid based vaccines. Since nucleic acid normally cannot withstand physio physiological conditions, uh, so a delivery system um, or delivery vehicle is often required. Two types of delivery system are commonly used, um, either the use of uh, viral vectors or the non-viral vector based particles, uh, which usually are uh, lipid based nanoparticles. Uh, the microfiltration technology can actually be used in um, preparing both uh, delivery uh, systems, um, but I'm going to talk about the viral vectors since uh, this is related to uh, cell rupture. Uh, we have uh, uh, other literatures and uh, references for uh, lipid-based nanoparticles, um, and we can uh, share them more, uh, share more with you uh, afterwards or later on. Uh, so let's focus on the uh, the viral vectors here. Uh, so the the vectors of interest here is the adeno-associated viruses or the AVs. Uh, they are very popular viruses and has uh, actually been used in the uh, approved therapies. Um, AVs are commonly grow in either mammalian cells or insect cells. Uh, so regardless of what host cells are used, uh, cell rupture is required to release the. Uh, the virus because uh, they won't be secreted uh, by the host cell. So the objective of this study uh, is to compare uh, the AAV vector recovery efficiency between uh, two different methods. One is the traditional fruit stall method and the other is the uh, use the microfestizer technology. Um, the condition used in this test is the, uh, the virus were uh, expressed in a um, mammalian cell, which is the HEC293 cells here, and suspended in a buffer before uh, cell rupture. Uh, the Fritzville protocol, uh, protocol was carried out by five cycles of uh, uh, Fritzville cycles, uh, in involving uh, freezing the cells in the dry ice uh, anthropropanol bath and thawing them at 37 degrees. Uh, the process condition for the microfertilizer processor um, was one pass at 4,000 PSI, which is not a super high pressure, through a 200 micron interaction chamber. Uh, so you can see here, uh, because the mammalian cells are easy uh, to rupture, uh, you don't need a super high shear rate. So we use the combination of uh, a slightly larger micro channel and a lower pressure. But this is enough to rupture the cells, as you can see uh, from the microscope picture here. Um, after just the one pass, uh, almost all the cells uh, were completely ruptured, uh, even at this lower pressure. And when uh, you compare the viral titer uh, results um, via the DDPCR analysis, uh, as shown in this graph here, uh, you can see amount of AAV harvest using the microfidelity technology is significantly higher. In this case, it's about 50% higher than that obtained through the traditional free throw method. Also, the free throw method um, is a very tedious method, and it took about five hours to complete uh, the entire uh, test um, with same amount of sample or cell or, or cells. Uh, but the microfertilizer processor was done in less than one hour, uh, including all the preparation and sanitizing step. So this is like 80% reduction in the processing time. Uh, and actually, with this. Uh, this example concludes all my uh, all my examples or case studies that I'd like to share with you today. Uh, I could go through uh, another quick slide before we pause for questions. Does that sound good to you, Steve? All right. So bef before my I, I, I conclude my presentation, I just want to show you quickly uh, our product lines here. Uh, the top row here shows our different um, lab or bench top units. Uh, we have a, a good selection. Um, either with a unit can process very low volume with this LV1 system. It can process uh, samples as low as a couple milliliters um, with a few other selections that with different options that would suit your uh, specific requirement. Uh, down here uh, shows our uh, pilot and production systems. Um, as showed you before, this is our small pilot system. This is our uh, latest offering. Uh, it's a, a large pilot slash production machine, which is the M815 um, processor. And this is our M700 uh, production system. So all of the uh, all of our pilot production system, we uh, we have the uh, our pharma, biopharma version uh, that are capable of running uh, CGMP processes. Um, so these are highly customized machine, and we uh, we have many different options to provide you from a very basic 
pharma grade machine, all the way to a full uh, a full aseptic version. Um, we also have a, a CGMP version of our uh, lab unit, uh, which is the M110P biopharma unit. Uh, so with this unit, it's it's ideal for manufacturing a small batch uh, required for the clinical uh, trials. So finally, uh, I hope through my today's presentation, you were able to uh, know more about Microfelix and our technology. Um, and with all the examples I shared with you, I hope I proved myself that our technology is the ideal solution for many pharmaceutical nanotechnology applications. And with that, I'd like to uh, conclude my presentation. I would like to thank everyone again for staying late and staying through my long presentation. And I'll be happy to uh, answer any further questions that you may have. Awesome, thank you, Young. Um, and we do have a few more questions. Before I get to those, um, I just want to let everybody know that um, we are going to be sending out a survey. Um, we're always trying to improve these webinars and your feedback is very much appreciated. Um, it will be sent within an hour. It should only take three minutes, um, but your feedback your feedback is is very important to us. So thank you. Um, so yeah, we'll stay on for about five more minutes. Uh, there are a couple more questions that we'll get to. Um, if you have any more questions, um, please don't hesitate to either put them in the chat window or you can always email Young or Daljeet or me um, and we will uh, make sure that we get you in touch with the best person to answer these questions. We have a very, um, very good and important partner in India, um, Trident Equipment, and they, um, they are an excellent um, first pass for a lot of these questions. They've been our partner for a long time. So um, they, you might be, be hearing from them as well. Um, great, so uh, questions. Um, there was a, a good question about um, graphene. Um, can this technology be used uh, for graphene um, exfoliation? Absolutely, yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> we um, so we, we fall into this mechanical exfoliation process and uh, with the with the uniform shear shear forces and impact forces we generate through our system um, we are very efficient um, in uh, exfoliating graphite to achieve uh, especially a few layer graphene um, not too much for a single layer uh, I, I would say rather a few layers um, and we have uh, we have done a lot of work and uh, we have a uh, we have actually published a paper. Uh, we can send send more information to you later. Uh, we also have a, a applications note that summarized that paper. Um, so um, yeah, we, uh, we 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 can definitely uh, help in that uh, in that application. Great. There's another question here about um, yeast cell lysis. Um, how, how is that different than bacteria? Uh, great question. Uh, so yeast cells are in general uh, tougher cells, uh, so they usually require uh, more higher forces to break them. So usually we, uh, for yeast cells, um, we have some results I, I, I didn't show here. Uh, usually we require process at the highest pressure, uh, which um, usually require at 30,000 psi for uh, multiple passes. Um, yeah, we have some uh, we have some um, data. We we have applications notes uh, we can share with you. Um, we have some good data. Um, they're a little bit tougher, but we can do it. Great, thank you. Um, this is a a question um, that you kind of talked about at the beginning about um, process parameters. Um, so it says, apart from pressure and passes, what other process variables contribute to um, globule size distribution? Uh, that's a great question. So I would say uh, actually, uh, I want to say it's equally important for uh, process parameters as well as formulations. So the process parameters related to our uh, system, uh, pressure uh, selection or type of interaction chamber, um, number of passes, uh, temperature, that's usually uh, the most important parameters. Um, but also uh, in, in my case study, I showed you uh, changing the, uh, the concentration um, can, can often lead to a, a, a big, bigger change or, or a big change in the process results or global size. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, that, like, uh, that's a lot 
um, many factors or parameters in there. Uh, the choice of the uh, surfactant, if you're preparing an emulsion and concentration, and the ratio of the oil phase to the uh, surfactant, that all that all is going to affect the uh, um, the the results. Uh, just one more quick uh, comment is. Uh, uh, we discussed about the pre-processing uh, already, uh, although I, I don't think the, the particle size is truly critical, but a good premix um, is also important. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I have two more questions. Um, let's, uh, let's do these two real quick and then um, we'll, we'll sign off. Um, cellulose? You want to talk about cellulose real quick? It's kind of the same answer as graphene, right? Yes, uh, it's just, it's similar. So it, it's um, we we can do cellulose um, very well. That uh, I would say cellulose uh, it's largely dependent on the type of the cellulose and also uh, pretreatment. Um, you can read a lot of uh, um, uh, publications that uh, pretreating cellulose uh, a lot of times will help with the. Uh, uh, defibrillation process. Uh, so we do that very well. Um, we can uh, we 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 have some uh, we have some studies we have some results that we can share with you guys if you're interested. Yeah, um, yeah. I'll uh, I'll leave that to um, Daljeet. We'll we'll take the lead on that, please and thank you. And the last question that we're gonna. Um, Respond to and then we'll wrap it up is um, 40,000 PSI. Um, do we work at that pressure and uh, is, is there, you know, any any benefit to that? Um, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, so right now, no, our, our max pressure is 30,000 PSI. Uh, we, we have done 40,000 PSI uh, before um, many years ago. Uh, so what I found what we found was uh, it's not that beneficial um, in terms of achieving a better results. Um, you maybe get slightly improvement in the results, but considering uh, all the effort you have to put into uh, into the machine, because uh, once you're at 40,000 PSI, not all your parts has to be, uh, has to be a, a, a higher pressure rated parts. That's going to increase your cost of ownership. And, and that's, uh, so the return of the, of the pressing results uh, do not match. Um, and also, I, I know some com, uh, some competitors or competing technologies. They offer system goes up to forty thousand psi. Uh, so when we took a closer look, um, for example, I believe uh, which is the system and the constant uh, uh, the sense that the constant pressure system they go up to forty thousand psi. But when we take a take a closer look and compare their system to our system, we found even at 40,000 PSI, they were not as efficient as us, even at 30,000 or maybe lower pressure. So uh, because of their system design, they're less efficient. That's why they need to go to a higher pressure. And, and remember, the pressure energy you put eventually will um, change to heat to the system. So the higher the pressure, the higher the temperature increase you will see in your sample, which is not ideal for many um, applications, especially for the biological products. Um, so we're as, or if not better, we're as efficient as even lower pressure. Um, so that's a that's a win-win. You can you can get a higher throughput for larger scale. So. Um, no, we don't. We don't. We don't believe we. Uh, you need or we need to provide a system goes to that pressure. 